Yeah, I'm an associate professor at the University of Pennsylvania. I'm in the Department of Psychology. Um, I've been there for about uh, eight years now. Well, when I was an undergraduate, there was barely anything called evolutionary psychology, so um, I didn't really know what I was interested in at the time. I was a bio major at first at Cornell University, and I had the opportunity to see a really good talk by David Buss, who was uh, visiting Cornell, and he gave a talk that, uh, to me, was just really impressive. And what I was sort of excited by was this idea that you could apply these principles that I'd been learning in biology classes to understanding humans, in particular human social behavior. The most important thing, I think, to do evolutionary psychology is to be really good at evolutionary biology because the principles that underlie the field are similar, in fact, are the same ones that under, underlie evolutionary biology. So while it's great to take psychology classes as an undergraduate, it's even better to take evolutionary biology classes and behavioral ecology, learning about the natural history of organisms and so on. Anthropology is useful, um, philosophy is useful, and in particular cognitive science is useful. But having said all that, I just want to add that people come into evolutionary psychology from all different disciplines. Your undergraduate degree in some sense doesn't matter as long as you're excited about the discipline. Well, like the rest of the academic world, opportunities in evolutionary psychology are difficult. It's uh, very challenging right now for people to get jobs out of graduate school, for people to get into graduate school. It's a very competitive business. Having said that, one of the exciting things about the discipline is that it's growing. And of course, just like anything else in the real world, you want to be in the growing industries as opposed to the shrinking ones. So there are opportunities. There are places where you can do graduate training that, when I was an undergraduate, weren't available. And uh, people are able to get uh, positions after they finish from graduate school. I myself did a couple of postdocs before going to the University of Pennsylvania. Those are becoming much more common. But in general, pursuing a degree in evolutionary psychology really means pursuing a degree to prepare to do research. I found that, like many disciplines, evolutionary psychology attracts people who are just very curious about human nature or what it means to be a social animal like humans are. I think that um, because it's a new field and because it's not well established in some sense and because it's still in some circles controversial, although I don't think it should be. I think it helps to have a personality for which conflict or at least a little bit of challenge and uh, so on is something that, that you're interested in or can deal with and so on. That's not to say it's, it's always going to be conflictual. That's to say that there's a lot of debate. And so I think people who are interested in engaging with arguments and logic and evidence uh, with other people are going to predominantly have, at least maybe they're going to be better suited to the field. Psychology, you really have to be prepared to learn evolutionary biology, cognitive science, anthropology, economics, and game theory. And so the first few years of graduate school can be challenging because you have to master lots of different disciplines. That's in addition to all the rest of things you have to master, like statistics and quantitative analyses and so forth. So I think that students need to be prepared to learn a wide variety of, um, of fields that aren't immediately obvious why, why they should need to learn them, but will be as they develop in their careers. So the degrees are going to be psychology degrees, but the training is diverse. Evolutionary psychology has grown quite a bit over the last several years. So you see the conferences are getting bigger. I think one of the most important changes that we've seen is in, at the level of the journals. So of course, the science is really done in the journals where people are publishing. And the impact of the main journal on evolutionary psychology, evolution and human behavior, is now on a par with some of the best journals in the world. What that means is that people are paying attention to the research. It also means that people are more interested in submitting their work to these journals. So that suggests that the profile of the discipline is getting bigger. I think we've also been aided by the fact that the community of researchers who call themselves evolutionary psychologists are broad. There's economists, there's anthropologists, there's biologists, there's psychologists, and those interactions have made the, the discipline stronger. And I think that's going to continue to happen, that People are going to be collaborating with people from other disciplines and so on, adding to the strength 
adding to the methodological tools and so on. That's not to say the discipline has rocketed in terms of size. It's still a relatively small field. Um, it, the conferences are small compared to other disciplines, which is both a blessing and a curse. Well, one of the interesting things I think about evolutionary psychology, unlike other areas of psychology, is that it's not a content domain. It's more of an approach. So if you went into linguistics in a psychology department, you could be pretty sure you're going to be doing something about language. Whereas if you go into evolutionary psychology, you could be doing something on language, certainly. You could be doing something on how children acquire syntax. You could be doing something on how uh, people choose their mates, on how people reason about social interactions. Uh, I myself do work on cooperation and morality. You could be doing work across a large number of areas. The key in evolutionary psychology is that we bring to bear this particular lens, this particular set of theories first developed by Darwin and refined by biologists over the last 150 years. So because you could be studying almost anything about human behavior, that also means that you could be using a wide range of methods. You could be doing anything as simple and straightforward as survey research to, for example, um, fMRI research with uh, neuroimaging and so on. You could be looking at other physiological measures you could be doing field observations. The techniques that you use to answer your research question depend on your research question. So, for example, in mating, we use a lot of surveys because you can't randomly assign people to condition in a lot of mating research. But you can ask them what they like, what they don't like, what their preferences are, what their history are, is, and so forth. My upcoming book, which is uh, published by Princeton University Press, uh, is really not only about hypocrisy, at its heart it's about one of the core ideas in evolutionary psychology, which is this notion of modularity, this idea that the mind is not unitary, it's not just one thing, it's made up of lots of little parts all working together. And sometimes those parts work in harmony, and sometimes they conflict with each other. With each other. And so what I was interested in in, in in talking about in the book was all these different aspects in which humans have these internal conflicts in their head how you can simultaneously sometimes believe two different things. You can uh, have what a hypocrisy, that is, you can think that something is wrong and then do that thing. And the reason is just that you have different modules in your head, and which ones in charge at any given time determines what you do, what you say, and so on. And so the book is really kind of a lighthearted discussion of human inconsistency. And in, in that sense, it's really a vehicle to talk about this idea of modularity and how human minds consist of lots of different parts. Biology, and a great place to start is Richard Dawkins' The Selfish Gene. Many students have probably already read it, but if they haven't, it's a really wonderful book, just re-released with its 30th anniversary edition, as good now as it was in 1976. Another great book is Steve Pinker's How the Mind Works. It's a lengthy book, but pretty pretty uh, good reading. That is to say, it's not um, written for the advanced graduate student. I think someone who's just entering graduate school or at that level would be perfectly able to, to master it. I think that would, would be another great place to start. Another great bi book in biology, which other people wouldn't recommend, but I think is just great, is George Williams' book, Adaptation and Natural Selection. It was written in the mid-60s, and yet the ideas are as cogent today as they were when he wrote the book. Evolutionary psychology as a new discipline requires tenacity because it has all of the usual challenges of science, that is, trying to discover something new that no one else knew before, doing it cleanly and correctly, and then it has the added element of being novel and therefore at least somewhat controversial. So I think good evolutionary psychologists have to have all of those features that good scientists have. You have to be smart, you have to work hard, you have to be ready to deal with setbacks, and in evolutionary psychology, you have to be tenacious. You can't give up.